everybody, James Green here with Actual Tech Media. Um, I am partner and VP of content, and I'm gonna be hosting a Q&A today that harkens back to an event that we ran um, probably close to two months ago now, uh, back at the end of August. No, so I guess only a month and a half ago. Um, a huge virtual online summit where we were uh, honored to host thousands of guests and a bunch of great presenters to talk about uh, building a plan for their IT uh, environment and hitting their business goals and all kinds of interesting stuff. And it was such a great event and there were tons of great questions. And one of the disappointing things was there were so many great questions that we weren't able to get to just so that we could stay on schedule and get through the whole show. And so what we decided to do was run a bunch of uh, Q&A events after the fact to get with the presenters and ask some of the questions we weren't able to get to on the event. So um, today I've got with me Subaya, who uh, presented on the event on behalf of um, Haiku and their alliance with Nutanix. And uh, Subaya had some awesome questions that, like I said, we just weren't able to get to. So we're gonna try and get to some of those today. So Subaya, hey, thanks for being here. Appreciate you coming on the show to do this Q&A. Thank you very much, James, really appreciate it. So, um, one of the premises of your presentation on the summit was around breaking down data silos. And mm -hmm. for some people, that is a phrase that they hear a lot, but I think uh, not everybody is familiar with the term. So first, uh, before we get into some of the questions people ask, can you just describe what is a data silo? And usually when people use that phrase, it's a bad thing. Why is that bad? <laughs> uh, great question, um, James. If you think about it, uh, at the end of the day, what the business cares about is the applications and the data they are using, right? That's what the business thinks of. But when it comes to the operations team, they think in terms of production infrastructure, backup infrastructure, archive infrastructure, and so on. They think in terms of many, many parts. What we tell people is that that's a traditional way of thinking. What you want to think in terms of is that what infrastructure do I have and how do I manage all of them together? That's what customers need, right? Instead of thinking them as independent silos, the reason we think silos are a problem is that you can say, okay, my production is gonna be one petabyte and backup is gonna be two petabytes and so on. That's your static allocation, but your business is not static. You guys constantly keep changing infrastructure. Your backup needs probably change, your policies change. That's one of the reasons you should have a fluid infrastructure, which allows you to move around stuff and be able to still manage them, all of them as one entity, rather than having to do a separate team for each one of them. That's that's one of the reasons I think we say data silos are bad. Think in terms of holistic infrastructure, which you really care about. And that's, that's I think that's the best thing for the customers. So those of us who spend a fair amount of time talking about data protection know that data protection especially is notorious for creating data silos. Can you elaborate on mm -hmm. why that is? What is it about data protection architecture that um, for lack of care can create some silos? Absolutely. So, oh, if you look at the history of the data protection infrastructure, traditionally it was the three tier infrastructure people had. Uh, they bought just a bunch of disks. They bought this uh, RAID, appliance, RAID software on top of it. They bought the uh, backup software on top of it. They were managing it that way. Then later on, they started having some sort of a smart storage infrastructure coming up, and then they started having some smart backup software. It became a hodgepodge of stuff over time. And customers have been evolving over time. And then there was dedupe appliances and people had object storage and they had created, and they also, a customer also think in terms of, oh, what are my business requirements? I have some short-term backup requirements, my medium-term backup requirements and archive requirements, long-term archive requirements. When they think in terms of all these independent requirements, they think, oh, maybe I got to have independent infrastructure for each one of them. While that sounds logically appropriate and right, the problem is that management becomes a nightmare because now you have all these independent moving parts. And as I said, the same thing like what I said earlier about data silos, planning becomes a challenging thing. You might have space in one, but your requirements aren't different. That's one of the reasons I think people have to think in terms of What's my broader requirement and what's my broader data set and how do I manage in one single thing rather than having to do all these different silos? Got it. You talked in your presentation about protecting file storage specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. That's been an interesting challenge uh, to, to back up, especially large 
um, file systems that lots of users are accessing at any given time. And you talked about um, something interesting that you've worked with Nutanix to build called CFT, uh, mm -hmm. continuous file tracking. I think a lot of people uh, may be familiar with CBT. Can you talk a little bit about uh, CFT and elaborate on what that is and how it works? I think it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, many customers, I, I always tell customers, you know, there's a backing up of file system versus backing up of VM and apps. Um, backing up of VM and apps are relatively much more cleaner, easier than backing up actually file system. People say, why is that? The reason is in the file system, the number of objects you deal with from a backup perspective, it's quite large. Imagine you have a file system with 100 million files. That's 100 million objects. And at any point in time, you could have a variety of changes. You could have 1% data change rate, or you could have 10% data change rate. And it changes all over the time. Traditional backup software, the way it actually happen is that when you want to backup, it'll say, okay, day one, it has to backup all the 100 million files. Day two, the way it would actually do is that you normally logically think you want to back up only the changed files. The way you do changed files in a traditional backup software is they will walk through the entire 100 million files, what they call walking the tree, the entire 100 million files and the directory structures in addition to that, and then figure out what's changed. In an average customer, less than in a like large file system like 100 million files, typically less than 1% of the data changes, which is 1 million files in a 100 million file system, right? But the way people end up doing is they crawl the entire 100 million files. As many of you know, crawling, the challenge with crawling, people say, so what's the problem? So yeah, it just takes a little longer, so what? It is just not about the time it takes. What customers have to think in terms of is that when you crawl the entire file system, you're reading every directory data structure, everything, and you fill up your uh, memory. So, and you use a, and the thing is, so it completely changes the metadata pattern and so on. There's so many other things I can go into. It's not, that's not very efficient. That's one of the reason, and the other alternative people end up used to use was NDMP was the method which was there. Again, very archaic, developed 20 plus years ago technology. When we started working with Nutanix, we said, guys, there must be a better way of doing this thing. The, who, does, who knows what chain files have changed? That's the file system, right? And Nutanix team has been great at actually capturing all the file changes. That's called a change file tracking. So between backups, Heiko goes and tells Nutanix, saying, hey, I'm starting the backup. Tell me what's changed. They give the back a list of changes. That's called uh, what's called change file tracking. And then we say, keep track now. And next time when I come, tell me the day. So that way, every time between backups, we just copy, they just tell us the list of files changed. And we only copy just the list of files which have changed. And that too, in a very scale out fashion. That makes the entire file system backup process scalable, one scalable, very efficient, and it's for the customer perspective, it consumes much less resources. So those are some of the big benefits. It's the time, the value of money, and it's actually the less amount of resources, the operational burden on the customer. So that's a quick thing about why CFD and what's the value. I think you know you've made a big breakthrough when when you describe the old way, it sounds almost silly to have done it that way. <laughs> I think this is one of those cases, like when you describe the way you're doing it now, mm -hmm. thinking about crawling the entire tree to get it done just seems silly. So I think that's yeah. pretty cool. Okay, let's move on and talk about protection and the actual protection mechanisms. Um, anybody who's been thinking about data protection knows that agent-based backups are kind of a drag. And um, one of your claims to fame is is to be able to do the whole deal uh, completely agentless. Can you talk about how that works and where kind of the entry points into the system are that allow you to be completely agentless? Absolutely. In a traditional backup software, when they were originally built, they had to assume that they will not have the right permissions to enter, how they do it, things like that. They said the easiest way is that I was just write an agent. Every new infrastructure comes up, I'll write a new agent. It's just easy to actually do that. That's the way they ended up doing it. And the problem in architecture design, as many of us know, is that once you start architecture design in a particular fashion, if you want to change it, it becomes extremely hard to change because now it's almost like changing your guts, right? It's just very, very hard. Good thing for Haiku is that when about four plus years ago, when we started designing Haiku, we said, we have an opportunity. We got to design for where things have to be, not where things were, right? And we said, all of the infrastructure is smart. Let's 
also we can actually one of the big pains when we talk to a lot of customers has been managing all these agents I mean like you know, a lot of people say so agent come on guys it's one time deployment what's a big deal it is not about the one time deployment right it's a question of constant upkeep it's a question of the impact it creates on the system those are some of the big pain points customer store does on a regular basis and it's also the resources it consumes from a production infrastructure so we said let's do it differently so that was one part so what we do is that we obviously require credentials in the system so you have to uh, use a lot of the different mechanisms available both on the windows and the linux infrastructure as well as the physical infrastructure to connect the systems that's something we do apart from that the way we end up doing uh, is that we want to connect only to take as much as possible only to take a snapshot because the key thing we realize is that when we do want to do the real backup meaning the moving the data from after the application consistency it's the moving the data right when we want to move the data we don't want to touch the production infrastructure we want to be able to do it completely offloaded one that's one of the reasons the way we end up doing is that we we log into the system quiet take a snapshot let the application go so that there's no more touching the production from that point on this entire thing six seconds it's done then we take the snapshot and then back up the data off the snapshot so we don't need an agent sitting on the server and consuming the cpu cycles that's that's the way we end up doing uh james and that that's one of the reason it's so much more efficient for the customer that makes sense um so there were a number of people on the event asking about protecting physical servers um mm -hmm. because you don't have an agent to go install on them is there a way that you can still protect those Great question. So one of the things which uh, we uh, tell people is that even physical, you should be able to back up without agents. Customers are moving as much as possible from physical to virtual servers, but we know that physically can never get rid of physical, right? Because there are a lot of reasons why customers end up having physical, and we are able to back up even physical servers without any agents, and we don't deploy anything. on that we don't uh, put any driver or anything like that it makes it much more still we are able to do it efficiently for the customer and that's that's the beauty of our solution i mean the question is that at the end of the day this is all done to simplify the operational administration for the customer so it, that's that's what's the primary focus for us okay um last question on protection is about application consistency obviously that's a very important part mm -hmm. of um protecting the the applications Um you mentioned in your presentation that you actually are able to guarantee consistency with a built-in SLA. Can you explain that and and how you're able to to guarantee that? Great question. So if you look at a traditional infrastructure, it's just a backup software. You go ask them saying, "Hey, how long it's going to take for me to recover?" Because at the end of the day, the the whole reason people are backing up is in case something goes wrong, they can recover, right? and when you tell the business business says hey how long is going to take to recover that's the question business asks you and you should be able to confidently tell hey i can recover the data within a particular period of time that's the business sla when you talk to your business that's the sla you got to talk about right so that's many people say oh no 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 that's what i talk that's great so if you ask the backup vendor going saying hey can you meet this sla the way they end up telling you is that oh um you go to a reporting software within the backup software and within the reporting it will tell you at some point in the data it will tell you how long it's going to recover how long it's going to take to recover the that particular object or ml or vm or app well that's good the big thing missing is that it's a post thing what happens if infrastructure changes i can you sure can you be sure today are you compliant to your business policy that's a challenge customers actually have that's one of the reason when we did our, did our design we said let's ask the question what how much time a customer has to recover what we call the rto right we ask you the question right at the start meaning when we create a policy itself so when you apply the policy to a vm or an app any or or container we know exactly how much time you actually have to recover so when we what we do is that we automatically choose the right kind of backup targets and then we tell you saying yes are you compliant or not at every point in time we tell you are you compliant to your policies today or not it's just not at the time of creation it's at the every instance in time we tell you on a constant basis we compute saying are you compliant to your business policy that's i think that's the most important thing customers have to think of well it's convenient that you mentioned recovery a bunch of times as you were answering that question because that's the next topic i want to get into um 
there were some people on the event basically saying, I've got some very tight RTOs that I need to hit. How quickly can I restore with Haiku? I, that's obviously a it depends answer, but I imagine you could still speak to it kind of. Totally. Um, to your point, I mean, I think, as I said earlier, when we set up the policy itself for the customer, we ask them to tell us how much they have. So that's we, the way we think of that. So the way we think of that is that's the maximum time you have to recover. Let's say, for example, you say, I have to recover everything within anything within four hours. Okay, that's our max time, right? So now the question we always keep thinking of is what can we do so that the customer, you know, you never want to always hit the four hour thing. You want to do it much, much, much faster, right? So what we end up doing is that as one of our design philosophies is how do we leverage the intelligence of the platforms we are in? For example, Nutanix, let's take Nutanix as an example. We look at Nutanix as a platform, not a generic server, right? People say, what's the, what, what does it mean? A platform like Nutanix, it's an intelligent platform. It has, actually has snapshots, clones, replicas, all the functionality built in into the, the duplication. I can go on, right? All of it built into the platform itself. One of the reasons, one of the things we do, we have observed, uh, James, is that 75% of the, sorry, 95% of the recovery request customers get is for data within the three days, right? Within the last three days. That's the 95% of the request. So what we said was, you know, Nutanix snapshots are extremely efficient, very fast. Why don't we leverage that for the customer? We will still do the regular backups, so don't worry about that. That still happens. In addition, we maintain the snapshots. For a little extra capacity on the production system, we are able to maintain the snapshots. We automatically manage it for the customer. And when you ever need a file or a folder or a VM or an app, we can get the data right from that. Worst case, you already over the past the 90, 72 hours, not a problem. We can go to the backup target and get you the data. Not, but we still want to make sure your 95th percentile is extremely fast, more than the, much better than the, even the commitment you made to your business. So that's that's what we do. Uh, think. Not surprisingly, lots of people asked about ransomware recovery. Um, do you want to speak to, I know that's something that you guys pride yourselves on as you've helped lots of customers recover from ransomware. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Ransomware is one of those, uh, I guess I feel proud that we can we have helped customers, but I also feel bad that they had to go through this pain. It's one of those pains I wish customers don't have to, but when they are there, can we actually help us, help them is the big thing which we always think in terms of. The way, when we think in terms of ransomware, we, what we, one of the things we do, uh, James, is that we always give customers a, what we call our best practice guide and tell them, please follow those instructions. But there are things happening in the organization. For example, a recent customer, one of the customers in North America for us, uh, middle of the night, at not middle of 10 o'clock on Sunday night, he calls one of our salesperson and says, can you please help me? Because the only thing running in my infrastructure is Haiku. And uh, can, can it looks like it can actually help. Can you do something about it? Our engineers immediately jumped on. The good thing is because of the way we integrate with Nutanix, right? What happens is that in addition to the backup infrastructure, we also have a certain number of snapshots which are tagged as Haiku and we protect it properly. And because it's there, the customer did not, customer was able to get back right back to the last target backup, even though we didn't actually have to even go to the backup target, we could get it right from the Nutanix, we were able to get the customer up and running. The customer was extremely happy because we saved more than a million dollar in ransomware. That was just one example. In addition to, because of a tight integration with Nutanix, we also leverage some of the worm functionality built into Nutanix. If you use a Nutanix object storage, they have the right ones ready, the worm functionality, right? And because of that, customers can be assured that even if you get a ransomware and somebody tries to delete it, not a problem, the data will still, backup data will be there as a secondary copy for you. You still want to protect your network and so on. I'm not saying that's not a replacement, but if you ever still get compromised, we are there to help you. Great. Another common question was about, let's say I have a failure that I'm not able to recover from right now. Are there mechanisms that are a part of the platform that can help me with disaster recovery, some sort of failover, um, restore to a different location sort of things? Absolutely. So one of the things like, um, I'll tell you there are cases where what happened was the customer actually had their traditional three tier, uh, VMware infrastructure and, uh, like something bad happened in the sense they lost their entire cluster for a variety of reasons. And when that actually happened, the good thing for the customer was 
they had a Nutanix infrastructure running right next to it. They had for some other applications attack. But this was, the VMware was also important for them because they had other production applications running. The good thing with Haiku, because we were, and one was running, uh, VMware was running ESX and uh, Nutanix was running AHP. The customer was able to on the fly decide to say, you know what, I want to bring some number of ESX machines on the AHP Nutanix cluster. And they were able to just restore it, get it up and running. And Haiku took care of all the conversion, all that stuff, and being able to get it up and running for the customer. That was just one example where we'd be able to help the customer do the migration, disaster recovery, I guess, in a very uh, cross-cluster disaster recovery for customers. That's something that's number one, right? The other thing there are who say, you know, they want to use the public cloud as the DR target, right? And in the sense that because they, they already have credits, Microsoft or AWS or GCP, and they say they want to use that for that. We can help the customer even in that case. It is just not about the local multi-cluster recovery being able to recover on the cloud. So that is something which we do for customers. And it's the biggest thing we pride ourselves is the one-click simplicity that we can do for them. The simplicity is huge because one of the really tricky things about using multiple clouds is that each one has its own nuances and you have to understand how that one works. Uh, something I've heard you say before that I think would be interesting here uh, as we move on to talk about multi-cloud is that you basically built what Haiku is doing in each cloud unique to that cloud, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about how <clears throat> that helps alleviate the need to understand as, as the customer, the nuances of every cloud, if I'm going to protect and restore data there? A great question. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, right, as you, as you clearly point out, every cloud has its own unique terminology, APIs, Infrastructure, underlying infrastructure, platform infrastructure, everything is slightly different, right? Everybody has a slightly different thing. The traditional approach most backup vendors have said is that, you know what, they want to expand the market quickly. So the approach most people said was that, I will build the lowest common denominator so that it could work across all of the clouds and do a little bit of, as Simon Marcio likes to call it, the glue between the layers and then connect and uh, stitch the whole thing together. While it sounds nice, you can cover a breadth but the bigger challenge for the customer is that when they invest in these platforms, be it Nutanix, VMware, uh, Azure, GCP, all these, all these are intelligent platforms the customer is consciously choosing to do. And what we want to make sure the customer gets the best of each of the clouds rather than, uh, okay, okay, equal to the lowest common denominator. That's not what you want, right? So one of the conscious things, which is more, or the way I always tell people, it's engineering wise is much more expensive but customer-wise, it's much more better, is that for every cloud, we built it natively for that particular cloud. And as I said, the biggest advantage people say, so what is the big benefit of this purpose-built? Because that's what we keep telling purpose-built. They say, what's the benefit of being purpose-built? It's a look, when you're using the cloud, it feels and looks and feels like the same, the same terminology. Um, it's actually leverages the power of the platform, meaning the last snapshots of clones, replicas built into the platform. And that's the big thing we always think of is that purpose built is better because almost the simple and as you always think is you wouldn't take an Android phone case and put it to your iPhone, right? Or the other way around, because it doesn't fit very well. Yes, it will protect, but it doesn't fit very well. That's the same thing. Why would you use the one bad generic backup software across all of them? That's, that's our whole idea behind it. Something a lot of people are interested in these days is moving an application wholesale from one cloud to another. And um, I've seen a lot of success using um, data protection and disaster recovery technology to basically enable that move. Is that something that uh, you talk with customers about at all and help them do? Absolutely. So one of the things which uh, originally when we started doing it for a while, we just had our backup and recovery software for each of these purposeful clouds. Customers said, guys, it's fantastic. I love your simplicity of bringing to backup and recovery. Can you do the same thing for migration and DR? He said, what's the, what's the driving force behind? Because the reason, as we all know, every customer in what we call the cloud journey, right? They have to decide, they, they are at some point deciding which applications are going to be residing where and which, which infrastructure is best for them. So one of the things which we have been helping customers is that, simplifying the entire migration process from one cloud to the other. Our philosophy we say is one-click migration and the intelligent infrastructure to automate the whole process, right? And that is something we have been very proud to do that. We have been able to do cross cloud 
data migration for customers with one click. So that's that's something we do. It is just not about going one way. The way we always think it's almost like going on a ski slow, a ski trip. You go up the mountain, you have to come back from the mountain, right? The same thing. So we're able to do uh, migration both one to the cloud as well as back from the cloud because we have a lot of customers who initially went 100 percent on public clouds and then they decided no 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 it's not the right thing and they got to bring some back to on-prem so we help customers both ways cool and that's great because i imagine to some extent it'll always be in flux there'll always be oh maybe we should move a few things over there maybe we should move a few things over there Okay, um, last topic before we run out of time for today, we're going to talk a little bit about security. Obviously, a uh, topic that most attendees were interested in in one way or another. Uh, specifically, when it comes to their backup data, uh, the biggest question I saw was, where does the backup data live? Am I sending my backup data to Haiku? Does it live on uh, volume that I manage, or how does all that work? That's a great question. Um, a big thing which... One of the things I always tell, the thing about backup is that we are playing with customers' data. When I say playing, we are you know, touching customers' data, right? And backup itself is one thing we believe. It's part of the customer's entire data lifecycle. A key thing we said was it has to be owned by the customer because any other mechanism you do, there is always a risk of, for the customer, right? So the thing which we always do is that in on-prem, obviously, we maintain it in the customer's uh, data sets, which we do that our high recommendation for customers is to use some sort of a cable air gap the uh, data so that you don't lose something in case of ransomware or you're one of your guys or girls decides to get up to that you and delete some things you want to actually have an air gap so that is something we provide for customers that's again a functionality we provide but we leverage the customer's data platform that is something we do in addition we also help customers um provide you uh, data uh, backup capabilities to the public cloud even in public clouds, whether we run on-prem or in the public cloud, all of the data is always owned by the customer. We are a, the way we think of it is we are an orchestrator, the facilitator, but the data should always be owned, be owned by the customer. That is something we are very particular about, and I think it's it's an extremely important thing from a data security perspective. I like that philosophy. Is there a mechanism that helps them encrypt that backup data? That's a great question. So. The thing which we do is for customers is that uh, we provide a variety of things. We can do end-to-end -end encryption all the way from the source to the target. That's choice A. Choice B, some people say, guys, our requirement for the business is that it's not about the pipe because the pipes itself are generally HTTPS and encrypted and they have a compliant thing. What they want to make sure is that data at rest has to be encrypted. So what we do is, again, there are multiple mechanisms. If you go to any public cloud, a lot of the public clouds provide multiple mechanisms here. We do actually support the data at rest for the customer. Again, in, for example, in GCP, you could uh, bring in your own key or you can use one of the native uh, encryptions which they built in. So we have a variety of options for customers and encryption. I think we strongly recommend, especially if you go to public clouds, it's an extremely important thing to do. Okay. Last question, this is very tactical, so I saved it for the end, but I saw at least one person asking about an integration that you have with F5. Um, I think that could be pretty neat, and I'd just like to hear a little bit more about it before we go. Absolutely. So this is uh, for my customers' application uh, ADCs, as people look at it. That's extremely important for many customers, especially if you're running business critical applications. Um, one of the things customers want to do is that a big thing about F5, load balancers, things like that, is the ability of a system. Extremely important. And one of the things Haiku has done for many, many years, and actually we have a lot of large customers, is that we do help them actually uh, make sure their F5s is highly available. We actually provide monitoring solutions specifically for F5, and we have some large financial institutions. We can actually name so many of them. But a uh, great set of customers using F5, and uh, we'd be happy to help any customer who uh, will benefit from it. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for this. It's been a lot of fun. Um, if you're watching today and you actually want to go and grab Subaya's presentation from the summit, it's still available on demand. If you head to events.actualtechmedia.com, you can go and register for the entire summit, not just Subaya's presentations, but everybody's. Um, and then if you want to connect with Subaya or learn more about Haiku, you can always head over to haiku.com or uh, follow them on Twitter at Haiku Inc. And um, I'm sure there's lots more interesting stuff you can find there. Subaya, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. It was a pleasure to have you.
Thank you, James. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.